Hello YouTube, I'm Andrew Does Hair. You can find my work on Instagram at Andrew Does Hair. This is my client Alex. As you can see, he's got curly hair. But he doesn't typically wear it that way. He typically wears it like this. So throughout this video, I want to show you the process of how I would take his curly hair and not just style it straight like this, but I want to give you some tips and pointers as far as how I would cut very curly hair like this. Now, his hair is, maybe it's not the tightest little coils, but it is very, very frizzy and coarse and very resistant. You know, a lot of times when I post these videos where I say, oh, here's curly hair, people will comment and say, that's not it. And that's not even curly hair. But trust me, this hair is very coarse, very, it's not the tightest little ringlet curls, but it is very stubborn and very resistant. Let me also point out that Alex wears his hair straight. And because of that, I'm going to cut it straight. If he wore his hair curly sometimes or all the time, I would probably do a completely different process here. But because I know that he tends to wear his hair straight 99% of the time, I'm going to straighten his hair and I'm going to cut it straight. So to begin, I wet his hair down just a little bit or we could shampoo it. And this is to kind of soften up the roots and get the hair a little more, more willing to be reshaped. And then I'm going to rough dry the hair with high heat and high power and no brush while kind of wiggling it around. And once the hair is for the most part dry and I'm seeing those roots act a little bit more flexibly, I'm going to go back in with a, a brush, like just a basic paddle brush to start flat wrapping the hair. Now, I think of this kind of like, um, kind of like sanding. Uh, like when you're sanding, you start with a very coarse grit, which would have been like that rough dry. And then you go to finer and finer grit sandpapers until you get the level of polish that you want. So as I'm flat wrapping hair, I kind of think of the tension of my brush like the grit of sandpaper if I'm trying to get a smooth finish on something. And so the more I work with this brush, the smoother the hair will get, but it's only going to get so smooth. And then eventually I'm going to work with an even um, tighter bristled brush. So this is a boar bristle brush. Um, this is a boar nylon blend, but this will pull the hair even tighter than the last brush, which will give us more polish, more shine, and a little bit more smooth um, straightness out of the hair. Now, I don't start with a brush like this for the same reason I wouldn't start sanding with 2000 grit paper. It would take all day. But by working from less tension to more and more and more tension, I can uh, more quickly and efficiently kind of work the hair into something that is smooth and workable. One thing you'll notice as I'm working with this brush is I'm going to spend extra time on the corners here. Where the hair is shorter there, it's a little bit harder to pull it straight to straighten it unless you do have a lot of tension from a brush like this one. And the hair on top, I'm actually going to go to another technique to put the final polish on. But those corners, I'm going to really, really focus on with this brush. So here, my next brush is a nine row brush. This is kind of designed after like a Denman brush. Um, this one is by a company called Vess, but there's a lot of different companies that make nine row brushes. And what's key about this is it's relatively low profile with no holes in it. And so I can focus heat into the brush and really polish and cook those ends without the heat going through the brush and burning the scalp. Now, it's very, very important to note that when you're thermal styling hair, the heat will make the hair flexible and smooth, but where it sets, where it stays is wherever it cools. And so as I lift each piece of hair here and, and, I, and I individually kind of roast these ends, I want to make sure that I set them down in a place that I don't mind them staying. In fact, this is why your hair dryer has a cold button. If you want to force it to stay somewhere, you can heat the hair in a small section like this and then cool it exactly where you want it to stay. And so his hair isn't so stubborn that I even need to use the cold button here. And rather, I'm just lifting everything, giving it a couple seconds of heat and then resting it where I want it to stay and letting it just sit there to cool. Now, as I do leaf through the top here, that's what they call this leafing, when you kind of grab the hair in small pieces to um, focus the heat into the brush. I'm taking some sort of sections that are kind of front to back leaning on the head, and then I'm taking some that are horizontal, like side to side on the head. It's almost like cross-checking my work. And so I'm, I'm really just grabbing hair in like every different direction here. And you can see that the hairstyle is starting to take shape now. And so the first process, the flat wrapping, all of that, I was really focusing mostly on controlling the roots and getting them to lay uniformly. And then once the roots were under control and the corners were flat wrapped nicely, then I was able to leaf through the hair and focus on the ends. Now I froze on this frame here of this oil that I'm putting in here because I wanted a second to say 
normally if I'm doing this on a regular client who I see all the time, I put I put some kind of heat protectant or oil or something in there first. This is Oi Oil by Daveness. But normally I would do that right away. But but for the purposes of this video and for educating people, and anytime I do a first time client, I put the oil in near the end. And the reason is I don't want them to look at what the blow dryer did and go, hey, that oil did that. Not knocking the oil. It is a great product. It's great for reducing frizz and adding a little bit of shine. But I like to do as much of this process product free as I can because that really makes it stick that like, yo, this is the hair dryer and the brushes changing the hair. It's not the oil changing the hair. And so that's why in this video and typically with a first time client, I'll put the oil in near the end rather than at the beginning. So now that everything's been straightened, what this means is I don't need to put as much, if any, really tension on the hair to cut it. When you wet down hair and it, especially, you know, curly hair, it's very important that each section you pick up, you pull very tightly because it pulls out the curl and allows for you to get a straighter cut. But if the hair is already straight, you don't need much tension to get an, a straight, even cut. And so by spending, you know, eight minutes blow drying the hair straight, I just saved myself so much time cutting. If I were to try to put this square shape in the top of his hair with curls, first of all, I wouldn't be able to texturize it as I shaped it up as I am right now. I'm kind of doing two steps in one process. I wouldn't be able to do that with curly hair. And on top of that, I wouldn't be able to glance at the hair to see if the shape is right. You know, if the hair is, if it's curling over my fingers after the point where I'm holding it, I can't look at that and, and see if it's straight. I have to, it, it's, it's a lot of effort to individually pull each hair straight to check the haircut on curly hair. But if it's straightened, I can see from a mile away if it's cut right. I can texturize it as I shape it. It is just a tremendously faster, easier process. And so this is a case where eight minutes of blow drying saved me 10 minutes of cutting. And now that the top of the hair is done, completely done, I'm gonna grab a clipper and start working on the sides here. Now, because his hair is quite grown out and it's very bushy, the first thing I want to do is debulk the haircut with a number two guard open. I don't often use a two. Um, I, I will reach for a number two if somebody has very dense, very coarse, very thick hair. Um, if he had, and, and essentially with this two, I'm debulking it and only the area between these two green lines here is what's probably going to remain a number two. And I say that with finger air quotes. Um, so just cause I'm grabbing a number two doesn't mean that this haircut is a number two on the sides. Um, a very, very small portion of what I'm doing with this clipper is actually going to remain in the final cut. Everything above and below it will be refined and reshaped or shortened. But anyways, um, so I grab the number two, if I need to take a lot of hair down and, and the hair is very dense and very coarse. If, the, if he had finer hair or thinner hair, I would probably skip this step and just um, clip or over comb the top uh, straight away. But this debulking process really is helpful with, um, with much more coarse, thick hair. Some people will fade from the top down and some people fade from the bottom up. What I find that I do in a case of like Alex's hair here, for some reason, I like to do his hair. I fade it from the top and the bottom together and I kind of meet in the middle. And so I'm grabbing the edger here. And what I want to do with my edger is everything I need to do with my edger. I don't want to pick it up again. And so what I used to do is like I would finish the fade, um, switching back and forth between cl various clippers and guards. And then at the very end, I'd grab the edger again to line it up. But here, I'm just going to line it up and then set this edger down and be completely done with it. Uh, so I'm not going to touch the edger again through the rest of the haircut. But so now I've got that that thin little guide on top that I know is a number two guard that I that I put in there again the area between the, the green lines I showed before and now I've got these like bald guides at the bottom that I did with the edger and so I'm going to use my my clipper with no guard opening and closing it to, to begin tapering up from the bottom and like I said I'm going to meet in the middle I put in a guide at the top I had a guide at the bottom and now I'm going to work up a little I'm taking this sort of, sort of more or less bald area and stretching it upward and once I've done that in the temples and on the nape, I'm going to go back with a one guard open and I'm going to take the guide from the top and begin stretching that downward until they meet in the middle. So again, this is a number one guard with the clipper wide open. And so I'm going to pretty much take this up the entire side of the head. And right as I get to that area that I indicated earlier with the green markings, uh, right as I get right to that area, I'm going to flick this off of the head attempting to not leave a line between this one open and the two open. 
while I'm working with this clipper, I'm paying attention to the coloring that it produces. And I'm looking at the side of the head for dark spots. Like you can see up over his ear hair here, there's a little bit of a dark spot there. That's because there's a dip in his head. And so I'm making note of that. And now as I'm going back with my zero guard, opening it and closing it as I work between the one and the no guard, I'm going in to these darker spots and um, just kind of working out the darkness there. Kind of like digging out dark, dark parts in the haircut something that I think was kind of hard for me to grasp as I was learning fades is like, don't think about the length of the hair, think about the coloring that it produces. And so I might have an actual technical uneven haircut in that there's, you know, short spots here and there. But if there's a short spot behind the ear where there was a dark spot, now there's not a dark spot anymore. The difference that I've found between a good fade and a great fade is like five extra minutes of going back and refining and or, or even 10 extra minutes. Like some of these guys on Instagram that are doing these immaculate perfect fades, like what you don't see is that they're doing a fade for an hour, like nitpicking um, every little dark spot. So now that the fade is good enough or as good as I can get it, I'm going to go back with clipper over comb and I'm going to shape these corners a little bit more. And in the back here, um, I got this one shot that I froze frame here that really illustrates like this is what clipper over comb is all about. Look at the way the, sh the angle of the comb like just continues the shape of the head upward. This right here is what it means to have a tailored haircut. When people are like, like, you know, what, what like how do, how do you custom tailor a haircut to my head shape? It's like, it's really hard to translate through a screen. It's like, I look at the shape of your head and I cut your hair to that shape and then it works and it fits. And so this is what I love about clipper over comb and scissor over comb is like, I'm using your head as the guide, as the ruler. And your hair, it doesn't matter how long or short, like people will look at this and go, how long is the top of that? I'm like, I don't know. It's cut to the shape of the head. That's how long it is. Anyways, I'm going through here and just shaping up these corners to the best of my abilities um, to that shape that I kind of showed with the green line a minute ago. And the thing is, like, th these corners at first here, you can see on, on his right side of his head, um, based on the way the hair is laying, it is a very hard, strong corner there. When I'm putting in a shape, I want to see that hard, strong shape. And then I'll go back and refine it and texturize it as I'm doing here with the thinning scissor, texturizing scissor. Um, I want to see that blocky, overly square shape, even if we're not doing like some high top fade, flat top haircut. I want it to look like that momentarily, just so that I know that my structure is there. Because it is those square, strong shapes that make the hair act nicely later. And so here, now that I've softened that corner, it still is a square corner. It's just not as blocky as it was. For the product today, I'm going to use the classic ADH Moist um, that's uh, mixing ADH Dry and ADH Wet together. So ADH Dry is great for texturizing the hair, giving it that kind of messy, um, lived-in feel. But ADH Wet is really good for defrizzing frizzy hair. And so I mix them together on certain hair textures and, and for depending on the certain results we want to get out of here. And I jokingly call it ADH Moist when you mix them together. So what you will find as I work this product throughout his hair, I want to get it from the roots to the ends. I want an even coating all throughout his hair. I'm going to move his hair a lot, like a lot, a lot. In fact, one thing I'm trying to do here is bring back a little bit of his natural wave because at this point, it's been so straightened so much that it's starting to look fake and wiggy. And we don't want that. We want it to look a little bit natural. And one thing about these kind of lived in styles, these kind of messy looks is there is no substitute for moving hair. I am pushing and scrunching and wiggling his hair for a good couple minutes here. You almost want to add a day's worth of touching your hair into the styling process. Like you just wiggle, scrunch and wiggle, scrunch. And so I'm just going to sit here and keep wiggling and scrunching his hair until it looks better and better and better. Eventually the hair will look somewhat natural. And Alex tells me that a lot of people who know him are shocked to find out that he even has curly hair because he'll he'll style his hair like this and then he doesn't get it wet for a week and it just works for him. He finds himself thermal styling once a week or so. It works for him. And so a lot of people think like, oh, I can't blow dry my hair like that every day. You don't do it every day. You do it once a week and then you don't get your hair wet. And there we have it. That's one approach to curly hair. I hope it was helpful. I hope it was informative. If you were, if you got anything from this, please like, subscribe and tell somebody about it. Thank you.